Well, thank you very, very much. I'm deeply honoured to be able to give this Emil Hamdi lecture at Oxford Brookes University on the theme of the international community has failed Syria. My starting point is that Syria is surely one of the greatest, if not the greatest, current moral and political test of the 21st century. It is symptomatic of the failings of international human rights law and it is a clarion call for action to reform the way the world deals with humanitarian crises, conflicts and human rights abuses. I think it is an immense tragedy that pretty much the whole global community has stood back and watched while 500,000 Syrians have been murdered, 1.5 million have been wounded, and 12 million displaced as refugees either inside Syria or in other countries. That is a shocking indictment of the international community's failure to protect. To protect the innocent, to protect civilians. And as we know, between 90 to 95 percent of all those casualties are a direct result of the actions of President Bashar al-Assad and his Russian allies under the leadership of Vladimir Putin. Of course, there have been casualties caused by Islamic State and by other Islamist extremist groups linked to Al-Qaeda. That's true. And bad as those groups are, their degree of responsibility for that immense, unforgivable casualty total is very small by comparison to that of Assad and to some extent Putin. The mass aerial bombardment of Homs, Aleppo and now Ghouta is reminiscent in my mind to the bombing of Guernica in 1937. It is the mass indiscriminate bombing of civilian populated areas <coughs> intentionally designed to strike terror into the hearts of those people. It is not a bombing campaign with military precision or targeting or military necessity or military proportionality. It is the blanket indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas which is a war crime under the Geneva Conventions. But an almost great tragedy, an almost as great tragedy, is the fact that the international outrage over these war crimes and other crimes against humanity, even from left and liberal opinion, has been very small and very muted. Um, we have not seen mass protests in countries around the world in solidarity with the Syrian people. We have not seen demands for sanctions, demands for international arrest warrants. We have just not seen it. Now, of course, that neglect, that failing, is perhaps predictable from what we might expect from people on the political right, who have a pretty poor record historically when it comes to human rights abuses. But to find a similar silence and inaction by people on the left, liberal, progressive spectrum of politics is so, so shameful. The Syrian civil war began, as we all know, in 2011. It began as mass 
peaceful protests for democracy and human rights. <coughs> it was against a dictatorship that had been in power for four decades and had been committing all through those decades horrendous human rights abuses. The Syrian people felt that they had enough. They wanted change, and on the tide of the Arab Spring, they too wanted to topple the dictator and to ensure that they could live in a free society based on democracy and human rights. Assad's response was to massacre his own people, to turn his guns on his own citizens. Citizens who had non-violently and peacefully marched and protested in their millions to call for a free and open society. And this happened, this, this massacre happened, or these series of massacres <coughs> happened, without barely a whimper or a whisper of protest from the wider global community including from people who traditionally have always opposed fascism. <clears throat> so the left, which has a great and glorious history of opposing fascist dictatorships, looked the other way when Assad did his unspeakable crimes. You know, it's really painful for me of course, not half as painful for the people of Syria, but it's painful for me to feel that left-wing, progressive, anti-imperialist opinion, which is nearly always championing the rights of oppressed peoples, that these advocates of social justice and freedom, of liberty, of democracy, simply failed and continue to fail in these six years of Assad's bloodbath. Where have been the protests? I've been on almost every protest organized in this country, or at least in London, uh, against the Syrian regime in support of the Democrats in Syria. <coughs> I can tell you hand on heart, I've never seen a single left-wing or liberal campaign group on any of those protests. There have been a handful, and I mean literally a handful, half a dozen maybe, left-wing people I know, but that's it. I find that really disturbing. It's more than disappointing, it's shocking. These people on the left and liberal progressive organisations will nearly always rally to defend people under attack. <clears throat> but when it comes to Syria, they walk on the other side of the street. They look the other way. They wash their hands and leave the people of Syria to their bloody, ghastly fate. I know, because I've been doing this for 50 years, that progressive liberal opinion around the world rallied against Franco's Spain against the Greek colonels, against Pinochet's Chile, and against apartheid South Africa. I know, because I was there with them, but where are those people now when Syria needs them? What explains their silence, their inaction in the face of one of the great humanitarian crises of our age. When Syrian democratic forces appeal for solidarity, I can't recall a single liberal progressive organization in this country actually doing anything to help. Of course, what can be done is limited, but even the gesture was not forthcoming. <laughs> I have to say, and it pains me, I feel a deep, profound shame 
as someone on the left of politics, to see the way in which most of the left have said and done nothing to support heroic Syrian campaigners who are opposing a fascist regime of Bashar al-Assad. I feel equally profound and deep shame as someone who's been involved in anti-imperialist campaigns for half a century, where most of the anti-imperialist movement has failed to protest against Russian imperialism in Syria today. They protest against American imperialism, and quite rightly. <coughs> Why not against its Russian version? The Syrian conflict has been based upon a number of huge lies, but I'll just draw out two in particular. The first is that this is a war between Assad and Islamic State. That the basic essence of the conflict is between Assad and the Islamist extremists and terrorists. If that was the case, why did, at the start of the conflict, Assad release from prison Islamist extremists who are behind bars? Why has he put most of his military might against the democratic opposition and the civilian population rather than against ISIS? The gains that ISIS made were precisely because Assad was too busy killing his own people who wanted democracy. He was targeting those who were championing the rights and freedoms that we love and enjoy. He was killing people who wanted the very freedoms and liberties that we cherish and we have been. He was targeting the hundreds of thousands of Syrians who even today are involved in grassroots democratic organizations. It's really shocking to me the way in which the whole narrative around Syria has written out the fact that hundreds of thousands of Syrians right now are involved in grassroots democratic organizations. They are running the local community facilities, the municipalities, in the areas that have been liberated from Assad. They are risking their lives and liberty daily to provide vital public services in the absence of the central state. They are still calling for democracy and human rights despite the immense suffering they have borne. The second big lie is, of course, that the only options are military intervention or doing nothing. If you call for action on Syria, there are some people who say you are a militarist, an imperialist. The assumption being that action has to be military. That's a nonsense. And I'd like to explore this second big lie in a bit more detail. Because right from the outset, there always were viable, effective, non-military options. Which I and many others, most notably the Syrian people themselves, urged from the outset of Assad's support. <clears throat> now, of course, in setting out these ideas, I don't have all the answers. I haven't got a blueprint or a panacea. Better minds than mine will perhaps come up with more relevant, more effective proposals. But I would plead that I have some ideas, and they are ideas primarily drawn from <coughs> non-violent, Syrian opposition organizations, ideas that are worthy of consideration. So I'm essentially today a messenger 
for the voices and ideas and proposals of the Democrats inside Syria who want change and who want action. So lest anybody be in any, any doubt, I think the first thing to say is that Western intervention would, of course, be a big mistake. I do not support Western military intervention in Syria. I oppose that resolution when it came before Parliament and lobbied my MPs that effect, like many of you probably did as well. You know, we have to learn from the disasters of Iraq and Afghanistan and avoid repetition that would risk the possibility of turning the Syria conflict into a major regional war and a direct confrontation with Russia. Uh, Western intervention would, of course, smack of neo-imperialism and escalate an already dire conflict. And it would fuel a backlash. I suspect that Presidents Assad and Putin would have liked a Western military intervention. That would have taken the heat off Assad. He would then make sure that the focus became Western intervention and not his tyranny. And of course, any, any, any Western intervention would be exploited by Islamists to propagandize the notion that the West is at war with Muslims and use that argument to recruit more jihadists. And that would, of course, intensify the conflict and fuel further future terrorism. So in ruling out a military intervention, that leaves us with the non-military option. And one of the starting points is, of course, RP2, Responsibility to Protect. It is an agreed United Nations resolution that the United Nations, that the international community collectively, has a responsibility to protect civilians from war crimes and crimes against humanity. That has been agreed by the nations of the world. It's a United Nations resolution. It's not meant to be a piece of paper. It's meant to be a blueprint for action. To make sure that civilians are not terrorised, murdered, tortured, and made refugees. So, bearing in mind this responsibility to protect, as Syrian activists said many years ago, in fact, beginning about five or even six years ago, what the United Nations could have done and should have done was take the lead by mandating a no-bomb zone, an arms embargo, peacekeepers, civilian safe havens, and humanitarian aid drops. Those are obvious non-military things that could have helped de-escalate the conflict and protect civilian lives. And I am all in favour of humanitarian intervention under the auspices of the United Nations. Under the auspices of responsibility to protect. Now, of course, that begs the question, who would do the enforcement? And a lot of people think, oh, it's going to be the United States or Britain. Well, again, that would be the wrong thing to do. If the United Nations had succeeded in getting a mandate to do those things, it would be obviously best if the enforcement was via non-Western countries. South Africa, Malaysia, you know, Nigeria, India. There are other countries with appropriate support, who would have been capable of doing that enforcement. And there could be a Western component as well, 
but it certainly should not be a Western-led implementation of that UN mandate, because again, that would feed into Assad's and Putin's narrative about the big bad West. The question was, of course, how would you get this through the United Nations? And as we all know, every time this issue was raised in the Security Council, Russia vetoed it. And under the existing mechanism of the Security Council, any one member state can veto any action. <clears throat> so that quite clearly was a problem. And it's true that with Russia exercising its veto, there could not be movement by the Security Council. But as many of us pointed out at the time, there was a way to get around this. In 1950, the United Nations passed Resolution 377A, called Uniting for Peace. And it allowed for the General Assembly to override the Security Council on matters of war and peace. So what could have happened, way back in 2011, 2012, what could have happened was that resolution could have been invoked to secure the UN mandate for a no-bomb zone, or zones, an arms embargo, peacekeepers, civilian safe havens, and humanitarian aid drops. That could have been achieved, and I believe that certainly from 2013 onwards, that would have carried a majority in the United Nations General Assembly. But it was never put. All my appeals to Britain and other Western governments to use this mechanism were rejected, brushed aside. I was never given any reason. I was just told we're not going to do it. Why didn't Britain, the United States, and one of three or four dozen other countries, including many non-Western countries, why didn't they invoke 377A? Why did they just bat it away and let the Syrian people continue to suffer? I'll come back to that a little bit later. Another question you might ask is, why has the International Criminal Court never issued international arrest warrants for Assad and his henchmen? And indeed for rebel commanders in Islamic State, the al Nusra Front and others who've also been involved in human rights abuses. Why hasn't the International Criminal Court, which is the guardian, the legal guardian of international human rights law, why hasn't it issued these arrest warrants? Now, of course, you could say, well, what's the point of issuing arrest warrants? How is, how is it going to be executed? <coughs> A fair point. But, symbolically, the issuing of an international arrest warrant against Assad and others would have had huge political and moral significance. It would have been a warning shot to Assad and others that the International Criminal Court was coming for them. Now that may not have stopped them, <coughs> that's true. But it might have given them pause for thought. Or at least the lower level apparatchiks might have had second thoughts about committing those horrendous atrocities in the name of Assad on, on his orders. If they thought at some point in the future there might be a prospect of prosecution, even if it was 10, 20 or 30 years hence, like we're still going after Nazi war criminals decades after 1945, if they thought that was a prospect, some of them, some of them might have had second thoughts. Now what has happened in Syria 
the evidence, the overwhelming evidence of some of the most grotesque human rights abuses of our age is documented. The Caesar photographs of all those victims of torture chambers, political prisoners starved to death, raped, beaten alive, the legal case and evidence for arrest warrants and prosecutions is overwhelming. And it does potentially apply to thousands of Assad agents. We should never be under the mistaken assumption it's all Assad. He's had these little helpers all along the way. And they too are guilty and should <laughs> face justice. We will never stop human rights abuses if there is a culture of impunity. If people in power think they can get away with it, if they think no one will come after them, they will carry on just like they always have. <coughs> there will be no deterrence, no circumstances, my apologies, no circumstances in which they will think twice, no circumstances in which they will pause to reflect on whether they are risking themselves, ultimately, in the court of international law. So we really, I think, need to, again, ask this question, why hasn't the International Criminal Court at least done the symbolic gesture of issuing these arrest warrants to put down a marker? Having said that, there is, of course, the question about how to execute those warrants. And that may take many years or even decades hence. But some people have said that the International Criminal Court, having issued an international arrest warrant, could then authorise its execution. And some people have suggested that a snatch squad could be sent, or a series of snatch squads could be sent to Syria to seize Assad and some of his top generals. Now personally, I think that's probably a bit far-fetched, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Um, the raid on Osama bin Laden in Pakistan show that such an operation could potentially be successful. I'm not saying it would succeed, but I'm not averse to the idea that it should be tried. If there's even a small chance that Assad and other key human rights abusers in his regime can be snatched and taken to The Hague and put on trial under international human rights law, I am all for it. If it doesn't work, my response is, at least someone tried. The problem is right now, no one is trying and no one seems to give a damn. So, what could have Britain done? And I want to emphasise, I don't see this as an issue as the West versus Assad or the West versus Putin. I don't frame things in those terms. This is about international human rights and the responsibility of the whole international community. But I do think that countries like our own have certain responsibilities which we have failed. So we haven't, in the International Criminal Court, pressed for international arrest warrants. We did not, in the United Nations, press for Resolution 377A to ensure a UN mandate. Time and time again, when the British government has been lobbied about saving civilian lives in Syria, we have got either no response or we can't do anything. You probably remember that back in 
December last year, at the time of the crisis in Aleppo, the government was faced eventually with a belated House of Commons vote. A vote about Syria, what to do. In fact, there was actually no vote in the end. It was just a talk. There was a debate last December in Parliament about the humanitarian crisis in Aleppo. But there was no vote to do anything. It was just talk, talk, talk. Theresa May, our Prime Minister, didn't even bother to attend the debate. Her government offered no action plan. Clearly, they were not taking the plight of civilians seriously. Boris Johnson at the time, Foreign Secretary, did a futile rant against the war criminal presidents, Assad and Putin. It was all bluff and bluster, all shout and noise, but again, no action, no proposals, nothing concrete. There had been lobbying by some organisations in this country, but particularly from Syrian Democratic Forces, for Britain, and indeed all other countries, to coordinate humanitarian aid drops. When that was put to Boris Johnson, he offered just more excuses. He, stayed, he claimed that aid drops were impossible because they put RAF crews and planes at risk of being shot down. In fact, aid could have been delivered by pilotless drones and by GPS guided parachutes. The military technology is there. The government was even presented with this evidence to show it was possible. But it came up with this false excuse that it would put RAF crews and planes at risk. Now, of course, since last December and that shameful inaction vote, or failure to, failure to vote in the House of Commons. The focus is away from Aleppo, it's now on Utah. But we also need to remember that there are probably three million other Syrians living in other areas that are besieged and hard to access. It isn't now just Ghouta, it's three million other Syrians living in areas under siege, facing dire humanitarian crises lack of food, lack of medicine, lack of warmth in this cold, punishing winter. Again, the call, the need is still there. Aid drops are vital. But Britain, the United States, all the countries with the capacity to do this, of which there are about 20, they're all saying no. They're all finding an excuse as to why the civilian population in Syria should be abandoned. <clears throat> I mentioned UN Resolution 377A and the way it had been ignored and refused by governments back in 2012, 13, 14, 15. But then, finally, finally, Last December, one year ago, almost the day, a coalition of nations got together and proposed, using Article 377A, United for Peace, they proposed a vote in the General Assembly and they won overwhelmingly 122 votes to 13. Under 377A, the UN General Assembly voted to demand a ceasefire in Syria, an end to all sieges, and the delivery of humanitarian aid to suffering civilian populations. Why did it take until December 2016 to get that vote through? Why wasn't it put back in 2013 or 2014? And then, 
What has happened since? The resolution has been passed, but nobody has lifted a finger to implement it. No wonder human rights has a big credibility issue. No wonder people around the world wonder what is the point of human rights if even when the United Nations gives an overwhelming mandate of 122 to 13 to help save civilian lives in Syria, the nations of the world collectively do nothing. It is an absolute blot upon the conscience of humanity. I think it does show the failure, the limits, the weakness of international human rights law. The laws are great. The enforcement is so, so poor. We have a, a brilliant body of international human rights law, beginning with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, followed by the Genocide Convention the same year, then the Geneva Conventions in 1949, the Convention Against Torture in 1984, other conventions about the rights of women and so on. The law is there. It means well. If it was implemented, the world would be a better place. Millions of people suffering would be prevented. The problem is, we have the law, but we don't have the mechanisms for enforcement. The law is fine in theory, but not in practice. You know, all these human rights laws are dependent upon voluntary enforcement. It's up to the nations involved and concerned to observe those laws. And quite clearly in Syria today, that is not the case. Besieging civilian populations is a war crime. Bombing civilian areas is a war crime. Bombing schools, hospitals and mosques, all of which the Assad and Russians have done, is a war crime. The problem is that the United Nations also has no real power. It does some good things, it ha often has good intentions, but has no real power. Sadly, in the world in which we live, it's very limited what the United Nations could do. I mean, there are some reforms that could take place, which might improve things, but there's no guarantee when you're up against brutal fascist dictatorships and military superpowers, it's very hard for the United Nations to be effective. But there are two reforms that I think might go a very small way in the right direction. The first of all would be to end the ability of one or two nations to veto action in the Security Council. Precisely the kind of veto that Russia has used to protect Assad and to prevent action against his war crimes. So perhaps that should be modified to say that the Security Council can mandate action based on a two-thirds majority rather than unanimity. That might be one way. Allied to that, maybe there should be a much more direct and sweeping update of Resolution 377A to not only cover issues of war and peace, but to cover other major human rights abuses. So that the General Assembly will have the fallback position if the Security Council won't act to mandate action. And then the second reform might be to create a permanent United Nations rapid reaction force of peacekeepers and human rights monitors. 
who could at short notice go into countries to try and defuse and de-escalate conflict, or at least to monitor the human rights abuses there and report back to the General Assembly. I'm conscious these seem such tiny, insignificant things compared to the need. But I can't think of anything better. And that may be partly my limited brain. It might also be the fact that the real politic of the world makes it very, very difficult. The other reform that we might want to think about is perhaps reforming the International Criminal Court. First of all, it desperately needs more funding and more staff. It's massively under-resourced. And it needs also the establishment of a fast-track mechanism so that it can issue arrest warrants and prosecute human rights abuses. As you know, because of limited resources and staffing, the International Criminal Court takes a long, long time. You know, to, to act on human rights abuses where it has acted has taken years and years and years. And I accept that sometimes it will be a, a long process to secure the necessary evidence. But I'm also certain, speaking to people, that the ICC could act more quickly if it had more resources. I'm really conscious that these proposals seem almost pathetic given the enormity of the challenge we face, not just in Syria but in Yemen and many other places. And I wouldn't suggest for one moment that these modest, <coughs> minor proposals will fix all or even most of the problems. But perhaps they'll start, and perhaps there'll be greater minds than mine, they'll be able to come up with new, better ideas to progress things. After 1945, the world said, never again. Then we had the mass indiscriminate bombing of Cambodia by the United States in the 1970s. We had the Srebrenica massacre, where 8,000 or more Muslim boys and men were massacred. <coughs> then we had the slaughter in Rwanda, and now in Syria. If we want to honour the victims of the Holocaust, if those words never again are to mean anything, we have to ensure that never again means never again. Never again in Syria, now, never again anywhere and everywhere in the future. Thank you.